to those of you just tuning in, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Abdurrah B. Tohid, KIS alumnus of Class 2020, and joining with us today is Mr. Atish Kassir, the author of Stranger to History, A Song's Journey to Islamic Lands, and most recently of The Twice Born. Beyond storytelling, he's been published on multiple acclaimed platforms, is a contributing op-ed writer for New York Times, and the presenter of the Al Jazeera miniseries, In Search of India's Soul. Mr. Kasir, it is an honor to have you with us here today. It's great to be here. All right, uh, so I was first introduced to your work. Uh, so our library, they, they, they've been doing this thing called Author of the Month. So they put an entire section in the front for one author and your picture was there and your books were there. And uh, I had seen some of your op-ed work shared by a few friends. So I was like, hey, I, I know this guy. <laughs> and and I, I was looking at your books and uh, I picked up the smallest book because I'm not the most avid reader. So beyond your writing, uh, I want the audience, I want to myself get to know the person behind the typewriter. So I'll be asking you questions. It's a laptop, uh, by the way. <laughs> We're not in the 1970s anymore. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I got into reading and writing because of Hemingway. And Hemingway had this beautiful quote about typewriters. And I just think it's fancy to mention them. Um, third culture kid, what do these words mean to you? And did coming to a school like KIS help with the situation? so funny that you say that because the first time I ever heard those words was in Cody. There was a, we had a wonderful lady called Kristen Keeler, who was, uh, I think she taught psychology, but she was also the, the therapist on campus. And wow. she was somebody I was very close to. And I don't think I had really a word for what my experience was. And I was obviously, I mean, I was like a Delhi boy, but I had these like different intersections. And she was the first person to use this word, third culture kid. And for me, the thing that I've always said about Cody, which I find one of the most moving things about it, is that a lot of international environments bring together the people of the same economic background. It was like that in college for me. What was nice with Cody was there were the children of Korean car executives. There were kids, missionary kids from Africa. There were, there were sort of people from like orphan backgrounds in Tamil Nadu. And there was this sort of like a coming together of, uh, of almost of marginal type. One of the things I remember like when we were like grad, a lot of people were crying. And I remember like yeah. part of the feeling was they knew that this like intensity that had developed in Cody between us we would never be able to regain it, you know, in, in the world we were going into. And so for me, that third culture kid identity is really linked um, to this idea of marginality, to not feel that there's a world or a society that can easily support you. And, uh, and obviously that can be quite hard, but also fosters uh, an individuality. And that was one of the things that I felt like Cody really did for me. It, it made me comfortable about being strange. So uh, your book, In Stranger to History, you're trying to understand your father's religion, something that was uh, often attributed to you when you were growing up. Uh, and in The Twice Born, you were trying to rediscover your Indian roots. How important is this sense of belonging and nationality to you? Well, I don't know how, it's, it's a curious thing. Uh, it is very important to me because I've obviously been I've been reckoning with it all my life, whether it's the idea of India's sort of Sanskritic past and the way that that exists, then the British uh, sort of uh, imperial layer above it, or whether it's to do with the fact that, that I had this, this Islamic background, but I was not raised as a Muslim. So I've always needed to kind of confront these things. But the point of confronting them is in a sense to deal with their importance in the world and to deal with their importance among people, but not necessarily for me to regain a sense of belonging. I'm not trying to fit in. I'm not trying to get back religion. I'm not trying to get back nationality. I'm not trying to sort of change myself. I'm trying to like see myself against the background of these uh, very powerful notions. So, so it's kind of trying to discover what made you because there were a lot of elements there right 
you were uh, raised by a Sikh mother, you had a Hindu grandmother, your father was a uh, Muslim and uh, a Pakistani politician. You were mm-hmm. born in Britain and now you're living in America. So th- there's a lot of, there's a lot <laughs> going on, right? Yeah, it is, but it's, it's sort of, I mean, it, it sounds like a strange thing when you say it like that, but I think there, that more and more people have um, those kinds of experiences. They, they may have fewer intersections, they may have fewer of those things, but this sense of, uh, of, of a kind of, um, I don't want to call it an uprooting, but of having to balance two and three societies in their head at once. And, um, and at the same time, like, be able to function and be able to sort of be moral, be able to be guided by like a sense of like place. And so, so it's, 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 I mean, the, the experience that I had, I feel was, was a window into, into something that people were feeling more and more, and especially in a place like Cody, there were so many people who felt all the uh, excitement and the thrill of, of finding themselves among new kinds of people, but it comes also with a sense of loss. You know, if you're, if you have a place, if you have a country, if you have, those things can be very, very strong. Um, th- that kind of identity can be a, can be a ballast. And uh, it is hard when you have to reckon with the fact that you don't have any of those things to lean on. Personally, I think I can relate with uh, relate to that because uh, when I joined Cody, I was at a point in life where I was very lost. That's when I decided to move from Dhaka to India to a place called Kodaikana, which I had never heard about before. The two years that I spent there, I really discovered myself. Uh, I challenged myself as well. I grew up as a chubby kid who was never into sports. In Cody, I swam in rivers. I I ran the 5K. I did all these things and I really found my people and I found myself. And I'm a much more confident person because of it. Uh, Yeah, it's a wonderful school like that. I mean, I, I had a very... I mean, I had a very similar experience. Like it was a time of really amazing growth. And, and intellectually, I was in fact uh, telling some people just the other day that when I went to Amherst, which is, has a very good reputation here as a serious intellectual place, I always found that we had read more seriously in Kodi with oh, wow. Kamakshi Bala Subramaniam and Grana and people like that. We'd read Dostoevsky and Conrad and... Uh, certain writers, I knew books almost better than I would know them when we, when we were in college. And so there was this also this like wonderful feeling of intellectual discovery. You know, uh, it, it was a safe place for nerds. <laughs> like if you, <laughs> if, if, which is, which, is, which we, we laugh about that, but that's, that's, that's actually quite a rare thing. So it, uh, when you were growing up, did uh, your paternal grandfather's poetry uh, have any effect on you? M.B. Sasir, he's, he's very famous. Not at all. I mean, I, I would not have even, I don't think as growing up, I would have even known of M.B. Tasir's existence or I was completely, um, I had a very, the, the side of my father's, because he was completely absent in my life. Um, in fact, the first time I called him was from Cody, from that, you know, I don't know if it still exists, but near, near where you have uh, the shop, you know, um, where you get the food supplies and rations and things like that. And there was, there was those telephone booths and there was a big one. And then there was this very small wooden telephone booth with graffiti Um, all over it. And uh, it was from there that I called my father for the first time. And, and it interests me willing to say like, like, what is more basic, you know? What's your mother's name? What's your father's name? These are some of the most basic questions we have. And um, they were unanswered in my life or partially unanswered. And I kind of lived with that for a long time. And then suddenly Cody sort of gave me the, the confidence to sort of to face those things. And I remember, and it didn't go well. It was like a very weird, difficult phone call, but, uh, it was, I guess I felt it was a supportive enough environment that I could do that. I'm glad that Cody did that for you. Um, journalism, story writing, and most recently presenting in the mini series that you did with Al Jazeera in search of India's soul. What was it like transitioning between these different methods, uh, mediums, and styles of communication? So the two, for me, I've always liked that relationship with nonfiction and fiction, journalism and fiction. Um, Fiction can be very isolating 
it's very difficult because you're living with something that's just within yourself. And if you lose that strand or if you lose that kind of, that sort of inner intensity, there isn't really, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you have to somehow like, you have to bring it out from within. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of an arduous process. And, and if one has actually delivered a novel or one has been able to do that, I feel a great restlessness. I want to go out into the world. I want to talk to people. I want to hear people's voices. I want to see places. Like I, I, I would be in most situations coming out of one and two years of, of stillness. And, and, and the correct corresponding feeling is restlessness. And so the journalism and the non-need, it, like, it almost like, it, it like works as a counterpoint against the fiction. But then it also has this peculiar way of later feeding the fiction. So, you know, once you've written in a non-fictional capacity or you've done the big journalistic piece, uh, well, you're full of new experience, you know, and that experience is quietly working away at your imagination. And there'll be a moment when it'll, it'll sort of reveal itself on, in that deeper level of fiction or of the imagination. So those two things to me have a kind of symbi symbiotic relationship. Um, the TV is very new and very uh, like not something that I think of as like my medium as such, but it was like, it was very, it was really good to do it because it's, um, it's of course, like it, it can reach people far more easily. It's kind of a, it's sort of an interesting experience to work in a, uh, to work not only on your own, but as, as in a collaborative a way. Yeah. yeah. And I loved the traveling, you know, you go for, you're like out on the road for 16 hours yeah. a day and, you know, you come back at the end dead tired and you've been like meeting you know the kind of people that you, what you would do in writing is 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 one fourth that you know so you're really like you, it's a kind of it has an intensity and you do it kind of non-stop flat out for 28 or 30 days that's what we were filming and um and uh and, and so I, I i kind of loved it but it, i don't still don't see it as like part of my work or part of like uh, necessarily something that i that i consider a medium for me um so back to Al Jazeera and In Search of India's Soul. India has had a troubled history with its foreign rulers. Many call them invaders even. But the narrative towards the British rulers, at least in recent times, have been much kinder than the narrative towards its Mughal rulers. Why do you think that is? Firstly, I don't know if that was always true. Like when we were growing up, for instance, in India, uh, in the 80s, we didn't see the Mughals as foreigners, you know, like it was not, it was, we saw the British as foreigners because they never assimilated because they had no legacy in the population. They, 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 they always saw themselves as foreigners and when they were done, they were done completely and they left. And um, it was, it was, that was far more alien. And so this business yeah. of suddenly starting to see somebody like Bahadur Shah Zafar, who would have been something like 75, if not 80% Indian, yes, is very new. It's part of the politics of this particular moment. But um, nobody can deny that, that as much as Islam was a foreign religion and as much as the pe people who brought it were foreigners and at some point, that by the end, it was a completely assimilated part of Indian identity. And the Indian Muslim, in fact, it was one of the reasons Pakistan failed as a project because the Indian Muslim has much more in common with his regional counterpart who's Hindu or Sikh than he does with some pan-Muslim identity. You know, you or Brar are much more comfortable in Bengal than you would be with a Punjabi Muslim or a Ta I mean, you know, these... these, yeah, these I, like, I agree, like, I agree. Uh, so it's so because... it, was, it was, it was a deeply integrated uh, form of, of, of Islam that, and, and, and so I don't particularly trust the fact that, uh, that we're made now to look at these people through a different lens. Um, at the same time, like, you know, I've always felt um, B.S. Naipaul was a great mentor of mine and, and I've always believed or accepted the fact that, that, that conquest can be violent, that, that perhaps there was temple destruction. Perhaps there was a sense of a, a feeling of assault, but 
you have to confront these things and then move on. You can't try to re-legislate the pre-modern past in the present because that's a recipe for really tearing your society apart. So I, 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 I think that, that it's, it's, it's a kind of delicate balance of like on the one hand, confronting history, but not trying to remake history. That's, Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that actually makes perfect sense because, and it's true what you said, because beyond being Muslim myself, I, I am Bengali and I take pride in my Bengali identity. And this, this thing about identity, I guess it's become very tricky uh, in recent times. And uh, on that note, I want to ask you a question about partition and literature, actually. Sure. So Undivided India had a lot of great literature, writers like Nanto, Rabindranath Tagore, but with division, there was this antagonism in India towards Urdu and in Pakistan towards all, all of their regional languages because Urdu is not really a regional language of Pakistan. So in the post-partition world with uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan and India, how would we view the literature and the claim over Urdu as a Muslim language and Sanskrit as a Hindu language? Well, actually, in this instance, um, I think that, that Islam or the way that Islam was starting to be practiced in the 20th century and which fed into the creation of Pakistan was to some extent to blame, you know, because they, the, the idea that the pre-Islamic past of India should not be part of your history or part that you, Abra, should not learn Sanskrit, like all of that part that is something that one has to admit is a part of Islamic culture. And it's a harmful aspect of, of, of the way that, pe that one grows up as a Muslim, that one recognizes the period after Islam as your own and not the period before. And uh, I think that Pakistan like definitely in a false way took Urdu as their language. Urdu is not the language of any part of the land that is Pakistan. Urdu was the language of the area that spread between Lucknow and Delhi. And so they took it for this kind of almost a chauvinistic or religious reasons and made it this sort of symbol of what the new state would be. And, and I think it, it did that language a tremendous harm in India of the culture of Hindu Muslim culture in India. And suddenly, so we had writers like Krishan Chandra and Rajinder Singh Bedi, all like, six Hindus writing in, in Urdu, Premchand. I mean, right through was still primarily an Urdu writer. And suddenly it became associated with religion. And I think like India responded in kind and they were like, yeah, Pakistan is a, uh, suddenly this language that had always been a language of assimilation became associated with religion and with, with exclusionary like identity and became part of the world of like faith. And, uh, and as a result, Hindi had to be Sanskritized and Urdu was disowned. And it was kept alive in some ways in Bollywood. And now like yes, with yes. TV, you see it, like people use a lot of Urdu language still. So the language is still very much like alive, but there's a sense of not wanting to own it or not wanting to treat it as if it was one's own. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a huge shame because it's, it's the most original, colorful natural Indian language and it came up in a very like like I remember my Urdu teacher used to tell me he said there was this this guy the story of an Englishman who learned who said he arrived and he said you know I've arrived and I know every part of the Urdu language you can ask me anything and so this uh, this kind of like poet says to him he says well then you must know what a divot is and he says what's a divot <laughs> And it was this small little like light switch type thing. And what this, the point this man was saying to him was like, Urdu is not like Persian and Arabic. Urdu is the natural language. It's the spoken language. It's the, it's the whatever's colloquial is Urdu. Uh, I'll conclude the serious part of the interview. We'll, we'll go into your life in Cody. Uh, all so, right. all right, let's, let's begin then. Yeah. Okay. So in Cody, which house were you a part of? Blue, white, or orange? God, yellow. <laughs> yellow. Yellow? There's no yellow house. There, there was orange, there was white, there was blue. Oh my God, I think orange. <laughs> okay. All I'm right. failing so badly. I can't, this was an easy question. 
<laughs> okay, the name of your dorm. West Bartlett. Okay, Bartlett West. Uh, dorm parent. Oh, Mr. Sati, and then Mrs. Roy. Okay. Uh, high school best friend. Uh, Raul Parikh. Uh, go to outfit for a school day. What? Go to outfit for a school day. Oh man. I don't even remember. I think like we were still in that kind of Nirvana grunge type oh, check wow. shirts and like jeans. Yeah, a little bit of that. Uh, what was your roommate's most intolerable habit? Um, oh my God. I mean, my roommates were at each other's throats. So I was the sort of peacemaker, but I didn't have any time to look at the small intolerable habits but one of them was that he was a kind of insomniac and would like aditya would and he would like keep the lights on till two and three in the morning and so that like that tube light would just be like in your face while you were trying to sleep which was a pretty difficult situation so uh, i hope you remember what canteen was what was your ca favorite canteen song oh oasis uh, don't look back in anger favorite teacher um, you know, this guy, Philip Daly, who taught me just once, and then he, I think he either got very sick or died, but he was this American English teacher, and he was just a real maverick and super cool, and I mean, he wasn't my teacher for a very long time, but I really loved him. What was your favorite dish at the cafeteria? Uh, I loved lunch. I thought lunch was just straight out desi food with dal and curry and then he was yeah. delicious. Dinner was always appalling. Okay. Best reading spot in Cody? You know, I loved the quad. I actually loved like just the, that feeling of like leaning back against the pillar, people coming and going and like just like, the, it was a nice sense of like there was a little bit of disruption but you could also focus. I really missed that place actually. Hiking, love or hate? Loved it actually. Lo like learned all about it in Cody. I think I almost got a tar pin. Okay, PE class, love or hate? Hate. I was <laughs> mild, and I also like fainted. Oh, <laughs> like wow. the first time I like played yeah, football in Cody. Like I guess I'd had jaundice as a kid, and it was the altitude. And so like, I was like the kid who literally arrived and then like passed out and hit the goalpost. <laughs> and so it, was like a, it was a very inauspicious beginning. Yeah, no, uh, one regret or missed opportunity from your time in Cody. I wish I'd learned Tamil. I find it so crazy that, cause I love languages and I like pick them up quite fast. And I just thought like here was just totally different linguistic group. And I was there for four years and I could so easily have started out on some, and I just, I was a fool. I didn't take it seriously. And it just could have like really like enriched me linguistically. One person from Cody, classmate, senior, junior, or staff that you would uh, like to get back in touch with? Oh, you know, weirdly, she actually just died. So I feel the regret even more acutely, but Sheila so Menon. Sorry was just the most wonderful, wonderful person. Like the, that she, she taught me some of the like the best, she taught me to okay, but she was just this incredibly deep learned person. And I just always thought like, I was like, oh, there's time, I'm sure I'll see her again or whatever, but I kind of let it go. And she just recently died. And, um, and so I, that's somebody I was, I think about. Um, one person from Cody who inspired or encouraged you the most. Um, Kamakshi Balasubramaniam, our, our like English teacher, she was just, I remember like the first time I, I she, she didn't really, be, I don't think she believed in me as a writer until I had to write my college essays. And uh, I guess something must have come out that was not part of like schoolwork, you know, like something like maybe a flair or a little bit of talent. And she said, she's like, this is really good. She said, I didn't, I didn't recognize it till now, but she's like, you're, you know, you're a writer. And you always remember that when somebody tells you that, because when you, you just, you don't really know that for a long time. And then when someone says that it's very memorable. And so I, I always kind of clung to that. Last question, one word that reminds you of your time in Cody. Clavrack. Clavrack. Wow. I probably have not said it 
in 20 years. So, oh, wow. yeah. Anyway, uh, that brings us to the end of the interview. Thank you so much. I wish you the best of luck for uh, any future projects that you have.